I, I actually think this is going to be super exciting. For Come on, five, four. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Talking Kotlin. Uh, hey, Hadi. Welcome Hi. to another episode. Hello. So thank you for having me again. It's, it's, it's really nice being on the show. And I have to say, Sep, I really missed you. Like, we haven't done one of these for seven or eight months, right? More or less. I'm not sure. Is that canon? <laughs> Is that what? actually how long it has been? I don't know. But the folks don't know this, but we, we, we record one of these every eight, nine months. And it's amazing how we don't grow old in that period. Yeah. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's really, Time really dilation. Cool. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. How AI does ama amazing things nowadays. So, Hadi yes, but how have you been? I am, I am, I've been great. Uh, I've been working on my book, which hopefully comes up as like a link now. So make sure you check that out. Uh, I've been doing oh, some... Are we, oh, wait, are we doing that? Okay, I, I just want to say that um, this uh, episode is brought to you by uh, Zero Chocker Almonds Prozies. Really nice. Okay. All the flavors, no carbs. <laughs> the link should appear down here. <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah, uh, and we've been doing... Loads of fun stuff uh, on on YouTube. I'm currently working on another large secret video, which who knows when that'll come out. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. How about you? What have you been? I've up been to? Uh, we've been busy launching the that thing which is called Kotlin Conf, which I'm really really excited about now. Kotlin I mean, Conf because, is coming back, huh? Yes, it is. It's coming back to Amsterdam in 2023 April. And uh, I hope that this this episode is released by then. I hope uh, that so, this episode yeah, is uh, released. Me too. I hope it's yeah. released by the time that uh, where there's still tickets on sale on KotlinConf.com because that yeah it's it's going like what do they say hotcakes no wildfire? I think so wildfire wildfire yeah it's really going fast really really going fast which is really nice you know because there's a there's a hung we actually added a new question this year to the 680 questions that you can fill out when you register. <laughs> and um, it was like, why do you want to go to Kotlin Farm Conf? Is it to Kotlin Farm? Ooh, that's a new one. We should do something around that as well. But anyway, idea aside, like, why do you want to go? Is it to learn or to meet friends? It's kind of like when they ask you for the gym, do you want to go to a gym to lose weight and be fit or, or meet friends? 50% of people said they want to go to Kotlin Conf to meet friends. I can understand it. It's going to be like, the event of the community well, just to hell with the program right like that's right we'll just yeah whatever anyway so yes exciting that's what i've been doing sweet yep. all right uh let's get into the meat of this episode because it's actually not just the two of us we have guests here uh we have jake who probably needs no introduction and we have uh Sakit, who doesn't get an introduction <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. Do you guys want to introduce yourselves? <laughs> well, I'm Jake. I work on Cash App with Socket. Um, we work on... Socket works more on the app. I work more on sort of libraries and infrastructure things. Um, and yeah, we do a, lot of, do a lot of open source and very much looking forward to uh, sharing some of it at, at some new stuff at Kotlin Conf this year or next year. Hey everyone, I'm Saket, and I work at uh, I work with Jake at Cash App. Um, we're both part of Blog, a company that was previously known as Square. It's confusing, we know. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to get into that part. <laughs> uh, yeah, so during the day, I get paid to work on uh, features in Cash App, where I mostly maintain uh, our investing platform uh, in the US. Um, I'm not working for for Cash App. I'm just mostly um, experimenting with Compose, a Compose uh, multi-platform these days. Nice. So Cash App was also known as another name before Cash App, right? It's had a few. It's had a few iterations. Um, so it's it not Stripe. As, no. It started as no. It started as Square Cash, uh, okay. and it was entirely email based. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah, this was in like 2013. That was sort of a pragmatic decision to to get off the ground very quickly. And everyone has email was, was sort of the idea. And then 
um, you know, move to a more traditional app where you send people, you have accounts and you send people, you know, money directly. And then over the years, um, sort of integrating a bunch of features that are related, like um, socket set investing. Um, we have, you know, if you're into money, that's not money that burns down the environment. We have that too. Um, <laughs> and a bunch of, a bunch of other just financial sort of personal financial services is what it is. Whereas, um, you know, Square and the Square Register are business financial services. We are the, the more personal side of that sort of um, somewhat being bank-like, uh, having a debit card and storing a balance and stuff. So yeah, it's, it's grown in scope significantly. And there's obviously a bunch in that space that will be added in the future. And I feel like Cash App is one of those brands that is burnt into my forehead, even though it's not even available where I live, simply based on the sheer amount of marketing that's out there for Cash App. Uh, I remember that whenever I was watching Twitch streams, there's uh, Cash App does this thing where they always gift people the most amount of subs so that they're always at the top of all the leaderboards for some, for some brand awareness. I thought the 100 Thieves Cash App compound in LA was maybe a little much, a <laughs> little, little on the nose. Um, but I mean, it's, it's clearly working. It's one of those things where if it ever comes to Germany, I, I certainly am going <laughs> to try to check that out. Yeah, it, internationalization is one of the things that's been slow, but uh, you know we're still making some progress on it. So it is in uh, it is in the UK, uh, you know, a subset of the features, and there's other countries that are uh, we we intend and hope to launch in. But uh, yeah, that's obviously a, a hard problem since launching in a new country means an entirely different set of banks and money and um, the legality around all that, and then transferring across you know, countries and it's, it's a whole mess of, so. Not just that, you have to also figure out how cash up fits in an, in a new country. Um, in the U S transferring money between banks, I heard that it was a pain. And so cash app or Venmo are great. But if we were to launch in Canada, for example, which we should, then we already have interact here that lets people transfer money using email. And so if, if Cash App launches in Canada, we'll have to figure out how, how to offer something that's that will attract customers on top of what's already available. I mean, that makes that makes perfect sense. But yeah, I was it was very interesting kind of uh, also diving a little bit into the Wikipedia article of, of Cash App uh, in the beginning when I was doing some research for this episode. What also came up, by the way, in my in my research, I'm not sure. Jake, do you know that you have like your own subreddit? There's a subreddit called M Android Dev, and <laughs> they use a CSS style sheet so that it looks like literally every single post is made by you. <laughs> yeah, my uh, my I, I do know this, and the reason that I know this is a pretty funny story. Is that um, when I was at Google and already getting in trouble for saying bad things about certain technologies in public, <clears throat> um, rhymes with it rhymes with flutter actually. Um, somebody reported me for commenting on reddit this like rant or whatever um and it turns out that it was just a link to that that reddit <laughs> sub where everybody shows up as me and so i got in trouble <laughs> i started to get in trouble for this post by someone that wasn't me but it shows up as me and i had to like explain to the these people like the whole mechanism of how this isn't actually me and it's like meant to be a joke and um it, it was it was awkward and um, hilarious in hindsight, but like not not fun at the at the time. <laughs> yeah. So you're yeah. saying that it's not you who I've been talking to these days? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the story I tell everyone. But yeah, in my spare time, I just go on and have entire conversations with myself on the Reddit. So. But I but at least I think you know the silver lining from that is that you've learned your lesson to not. Um, say things about certain technologies, right? I mean, right. you never yeah. talk about cryptocurrencies anymore. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, right? Yep. So it's all good. It's all good. So during during kind of looking this up, and, and you mentioned it before and as well, Cash App has existed since 2013, <clears throat> since 2013 uh, which I guess could be coined as the BC era, the before Compose era. Uh, so 
I'm just kind of wondering, and I guess that'll be the main story uh, of today's episode. You probably started out with some kind of code base, and then something happened, uh, uh, some kind of event, and then things moved towards Compose. How how did that go? How how did that happen? I'll just I'll just let you free form answer here. <laughs> um, yeah, I I think I could start there. Um, one of the things that we've done really well in our code base is have an architecture that is very uh, ha has a, a very clean separation of um, responsibilities, and so we have a we have like a a rendering layer like the view layer where. Um, sort of these immutable models get thrown over to the view, and then the view is just responsible for, for rendering that as content. Um, and where those models come from is our, our presenters, and they don't see the view at all, they just can emit models. Uh, and so we, like our architecture enforces this separation where there's um, no ability for those two things to directly talk to each other. They have to sort of talk through these well-defined channels. And uh, what that allows us to do is basically change technologies as technologies evolve without affecting the other one. Um, so as an example, like when Kotlin started, you know, really taking off, we could convert um, one without the other. Um, when coroutines started becoming a thing that was viable, um, we could start using that in, you know, the presenters without affecting how our, you know, views actually consumed and rendered the models. And so, um, when Compose and Compose UI started coming along, we were already in a really good position to be able to adopt it without really affecting the rest of our code base. Um, and you may think that like we would have started with, uh, you know, Compose UI, um, adopting it to actually render, but um, the the first actual uh, well, it's, it's not entirely true, but the it took a while. But the first exploration of Compose that really got uh, far and into the code base um, was actually on the presenter side. And, and I'll probably wait to talk about that. We can talk about Compose UI first. Um, but after that, we we um, were able to start, you know, using Compose UI just for um, individual screens without affecting the rest of them and, um, you know, changing the entire rendering sort of uh, system of our um, of our app became much less of a big deal because of this, this clean architecture. And it meant that the presenters that we already had, which were feeding these models into the view, didn't have to know that the view changed from, you know, traditional Android views to compose. Uh, and so that was a huge benefit. And um, actually Socket was sort of the one that um, is, is one of the ones who led most of that effort to initially get Compose UI off the ground in cache. And how, I mean, you know, Compose is, is, a, is an easy one, right? Because Google talks about it. They clearly say that this is the future. Uh, this is where you want to go. But how, even though you've got this clear separation of architectures, do you often swap things out for new technologies? I definitely think that we made a lot of good bets. And so we don't have to do that a lot, uh, especially not in like a reactionary way. Um, we, we very early invested in, you know, reactive programming in RX Java and that ecosystem. And that's how the majority of our presenters were set up. Uh, and, and once they're sort of there, they just kind of stay there and, and work really well. Uh, and it was only until coroutines came along and offered sort of a, a, you know, a paradigm shift where instead of writing your logic inside a set of operator chains, you could write that as more imperative style, you know, regular um, code that we we sort of wanted to adopt something like that. Uh, and then at the at and that's like an example on the presenter side. On on the view side, there there's definitely far less sort of dramatic innovations until Compose UI. Um, but as an example, like um, you know, we uh, the the app started to adopt things like constraint layout. Um, but internally, we built something called Contour, which is also a constraint-based constraint -based system, um, but in, done entirely in, in code, Kotlin code, rather than in you know, XML defining your constraints. Um, and so the, the sort of the architecture of the clean separation and also the fact that you know, all of our screens are sort of self-contained allowed um, individual 
either individuals or like feature teams to adopt things like um, contour uh, or constraint layout without affecting really the rest of the code base. Uh, and it wasn't until something like Compose came along that we sort of had to like stop and have a conversation with everyone about how we adopt this because it was, it is like such a change in how we traditionally do things that it has to be coordinated at, at more of a broad organizational level. So just for for a little bit of context for our listeners and viewers, did you decide to move 100% to Kotlin before you started all of this, or is your code base still a mix? What is that looking like? Can I answer this? Yeah, I was going to say, I, yeah, most of that change <laughs> happened when I wasn't at Cash. <laughs> yeah, in fact, it was started before I joined, uh, so none of us know I mean, among the two of us know how this started. <laughs> Nobody knows. <laughs> but uh, when I joined, I noticed that Cash App had already embraced Kotlin. Or most of us um, had already embraced Kotlin for building our layouts. So uh, when Compose came out, we had a luxury of seamlessly migrating our system because we were not using XML in most places. Uh, before Compose was announced, there were a few people who still enjoyed doing XML because um, as much as we hated XML, Android was uh, was always a XML-first system. So the tooling, the previews were far better with XML. Um, but when Compose was announced, it was easy for the rest of the uh, people to uh, convince them that we should uh, fully embrace Kotlin now. And then when Compose UI came out, we were easily able to uh, migrate our themes, our uh, uh, colors, and all other resources that were necessary. Um, I know that people uh, complain about previews in Compose UI uh, because they're slow. We have to rebuild after every change. Uh, but we had gotten used to that way long ago. Uh, we, we had embraced the fact that uh, our brain became our layered preview. Uh, and we also uh, got involved with faster iteration cycles by having demo apps, uh, smaller modules for layouts, snapshot tests, which uh, we can talk about more afterwards. I actually think now that the conversation has kind of always mentioned Compose and Compose UI, it probably makes sense if for the sake of clarity, to maybe give our, our listeners a bit of an idea about what it is exactly you're talking when you're about when you're talking about these things. So what's the difference? And why should people care? <laughs> yeah, I mean, Compose is a general purpose tool for building, uh, for, for basically managing state and reacting to state changes, and then producing a tree of objects that um, usually is like derived from that state. Um, and then that that's like a really abstract, like kind of terrible library definition. Um, but it is just this like wildly generic thing um, at its core, which is like a really small runtime and then a Kotlin compiler plugin that that does some magic basically to you know rewrite how your code executes at runtime. Um, and it can be used for anything. Uh, so any sort of tree that you can think uh, can be produced can be produced by um, you know a set of composables, which is like the core primitive of compose. Um, and the the way that the compiler knows how to rewrite your code is this composable annotation on a function. Um, but when you you know you think about like managing state and then producing a tree of objects, um, that's also a definition for like every UI toolkit ever. And so, um, Compose UI is an implementation of a UI toolkit that, um, you know, renders um, sort of a material-based um, UI starting on Android and now has sort of expanded into um, running on the JVM. And um, I don't know how we, how far we want to get into sort of what's being done in the multi your multi-platform Compose uh, repository, but also coming to um, the web and likely iOS platforms as well. And so, um, yeah, the, the dip, you know, the average person consuming 
what Google calls Compose is, is really consuming Compose UI and using it to render like an Android, um, an Android UI or, or, you know, material style UI and desktop or whatever. Um, but they really are two distinct components, which is important for what we can talk about later because um, we actually use Compose a bunch in uh, a non-Compose UI setting. So we, we target a totally different set of outputs than directly rendering using Compose UI. Um, but yeah, traditionally those terms are sort of conflated, um, which is why um, I try and be very mindful of when, when I'm saying stuff. It's like Compose UI is sort of the thing that, that does the rendering on Android and desktop and um, Compose or like the Compose core is sort of the general purpose library and framework or, and tools for, um, you know, building these like tree based things. That reminds me a little bit of uh, our discussions around Kotlin coroutines, uh, where people tend to conflate the uh, suspension mechanism inside the compiler uh, and the Kotlin X coroutines uh, layer of, of, of concurrency primitives, uh, even though they are sometimes quite disconnected, as our friends from Arrow show us repeatedly. Um, I guess at least the uh, difference between Compose and Compose UI maybe would also be uh, a parallel to what React does with React and React DOM. I think they also kind of have a bit of this decoupling. I'm not entirely sure, but I, I remember something about the, the general purpose version of React being used in, in games and such to, to also render their UI natively, I think. Yeah, the thing that really got me interested in non-Compose UI based compose work is um, there's a React framework called Ink, which is for rendering to um, like a terminal, a terminal output, like a console or, you know, like whatever. Um, and so you can write command line applications using React and it will manage sort of the layout and re-rendering and repainting, um, you know, in, in the terminal because there's ways to, to sort of go back and, and repaint and create these interactive command line programs. Uh, and so, you know, when Compose was sort of um, becoming a thing at Google, my, my intent was to always try and build an analogous of that using Compose, which um, ended up being this mosaic, mosaic project. Um, but it, it's sort of what got me started with that. And it um, has a direct line to um, this other project called Molecule, which is our uh, is from Cache, an open source project from Cache, which is our, our non-Compose UI based Compose usage, um, which we actually use for the presenter side of our app, not the rendering side. Oh, it's, it's funny how we always seem to get ourselves in a mess and tangle of naming things, not ideally, and then spending hours explaining to people what we've named what, right? But talking about uh, Compose and your adoption, you said that you initially adopted this on the presenter side. So do you want to dive into that a little bit and, and tell us more? Yeah. Um, so the first half of the description that I gave for Compose was that it's a, a library for managing state and reacting to state changes. Uh, and then the other half of that was producing like a tree output that can get you know rendered or whatever. Um, but you actually don't have to do that, that second half uh, and so what are, what our presenters are in cache is basically, you know, a simple class that just aggregates a bunch of data from like a database query or the network, the file system, you know, the, the state of the, the operating system that it's running on. Um, it aggregates all that, that data together into a model object that it then can send over to be rendered uh, and, you know, displayed for the user. And so the idea was basically, um, well, the problem was that we were writing this with something like Rx, where you wind up with these deeply nested, very complex chain of operators that are encoding logic. Uh, so instead of writing like an if else block, you're writing like a flat map statement that has an if inside of it. And then you're flat mapping in like two other observables. And if you know what all that means, you can understand it, but it's definitely a lot harder to uh, write cognitively and definitely to go back and read and change um, just because there's so much going on there. So much you have to keep in your 
in your mind as you're parsing what you know what's the behavior here compared to like a simple if else statement so um, when coroutines came out we uh, a few of us were trying to write a presenter built on coroutines that was that was dramatically simpler for managing um, the logic inside the presenters and so we we knew with coroutines like so in, it was often compared with rx where you know, you can call a suspend function in an if else block and have simple logic instead of, you know, the flat map thing I just described. And so we were trying to pull that off and we were failing. We kept failing. Um, the design was never really working. Um, but then as Compose was becoming a, a bigger thing, it was basically this, it was basically producing the code that we wanted to write. But the problem was that it was that that's at the wrong layer. That's at like the the rendering side, and we wanted that at in the presenter side where we're just aggregating data, but then producing data as an output, not producing UI as an output. And so um, we built this very very tiny library um, called Molecule. Uh, it's it's really like forty lines of code. It's it's not that much. It just sets sets up the compose runtime, and it allows you to use the the sort of compiler magic of Compose for just pure manipulation of data. So just aggregating data inputs and producing a single output. Um, and why that's nice in Compose is that if you have like two database queries that you're combining into an object, one of them updates, um, Compose is going to do something what it calls recompose, and it's going to sort of run that function again with the new latest set of data and automatically produce that that new model where in your code you're sort of just you're not really writing reactive code you're writing just simple imperative code uh, and it, it became it became this much simpler design um, for our presenters it, it gave us the thing we wanted which was building that that straightforward imperative code while still maintaining the ability to be reactive to changes of data and so um, yeah, going back to like the architecture thing, it'll, we were able to, you know, test that out and adopt that in a few presenters, rewrite some of the RX ones, and then, uh, you know, show people that this was something that was viable and prove out that it was going to work. And, and, um, it sort of is like taking over our code base and is spreading into, um, most of the new presenters that are written and, um, some of the existing ones are being rewritten as well. So. It's been, uh, it's something that you really can only do with um, like a Kotlin and its ability to have compiler plugins uh, and, and what, what Compose is doing. And it's, uh, it's been, yeah, it's a really huge win for us. So this is really fascinating, right? Because you're, you know, you're using this for something that, I mean, when, when people think about Compose, they're immediately going to think UI. They're immediately going to think, you know, the displays. And yet here you are using this for something completely different, right? The compose part of it that could benefit many, many applications that, you know, don't have the same needs that an Android application or any other application may have, right? Yeah, the, I guess the, the thing I didn't mention, the, the sort of most important part of that is that we can use that compose code in the presenter and target traditional Android views. Like we don't have to change the, the sort of rendering layer at all. We can use the existing views that are already written that already accept these models. Uh, and instead of having, you know, Rx be the producer of them, we have Compose be the producer of them. Uh, and so, yeah, that, 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 that's why I sort of wanted to stress on the architecture at the beginning, because if you sort of muddy that, they get, they get coupled and you can't change one without the other. Um, but yeah, by virtue of having that really clean separation, we, um, we can allow people to migrate sort of half of it without touching the other. Um, and that's, that's sort of like a sort of a secondary thing that allowed it to, to really be effective. I should also mention that because these composable presenters emit a flow, um, or they, they, um, they return a flow, they can also seamlessly interrupt with our existing Rx presenters. So it's not just UI that uh, interrupting with that they can also fit in in our existing uh, code base of Rx presenters or coding presenters. And is this a thing that you currently are? Would you would you see 
a use for this also outside of the the Android or, or mobile world? Maybe I built um, a Compose Web application, um, and, and sort of the thing the thing about this is if you if you already have Compose, um, you can you can do this without like a separate library. You can write a composable function and sort of have it be the producer of just a value, and then separately have a composable function which consumes that value and um, renders it to something. And so like in Compose Web, I do this as like a, a pattern um, where it's in the same module, but I have you know separate functions for like the responsibility of producing just the model and, a, and rendering the model. Um, the reason that the library exists is if you're if you're somewhere where you you don't have like compose ui or compose web or like an existing compose framework uh, and so it's um it actually it started as just an android specific library because google only publishes compose for android unfortunately um, thankfully you all have started publishing a proper multi-platform compose runtime artifact and so Molecule, the next version, whenever the, the next um, Compose multi-platform release from JetBrains comes out, the next version of um, Molecule will support every platform that your multi-platform artifact supports. So yeah, if you're on, you know, if you're targeting the JVM, if you're running on the web, or um, you know, eventually if you get the native stuff off the ground, um, it will work in those contexts as well. That sounds incredible. I feel like the obvious question here almost is, did, did you folks pioneer this? Were you the first ones to come up with this? Uh, not really. I mean, like, like I said, it's, it's already a pattern that you can do within a single Compose code base. So like, it's already a good idea to have a separation of responsibilities in, in functions where you're not mixing a ton of business logic with the rendering logic. Um, the thing that we did was just write the library that runs Compose, runs the core of Compose um, separately so that you can have it run, you know, just um, you can have it run completely separately without the UI part. Uh, and it's it's really not that novel. Um, there's no there's nothing amazing that we sort of figured out. Um, it's the library is it, it is literally like 40 lines of code. It's just the bare minimum to set up the compose runtime. Um, the same thing that, you know, compose UI is going to do. We just don't set up the part that produces, um, you know, like a, an, a UI toolkit rendering half. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, I, I don't think it's extremely um, novel. It's more just something that we, we took an existing pattern and allowed it to, um, run without, you know, compose UI. Do you know whether you folks are kind of like the only ones or have, has the, has the molecule library been, been adopted by, by other people who maybe faced kind of the same situations? It's definitely been tried out, um, by other companies. I don't, I don't know. Cause we get, you know, some feedback and, and, um, issues filed about, you know, various build configurations and stuff. Uh, I don't. I don't know the degree to which um, it is adopted because, um, again, like if this is only you only need the library if you if you have like two separate modules, um, one where Compose UI is not present, one where Compose UI is present, um, or whatever. And so, um, yeah, a lot of people might just be doing this as as sort of a, a pattern, um, which is a good thing, um, and it would be ultimately like it would be great to see um, something like this supported farther upstream so that more people could uh, by by like compose proper um, so that more people could sort of gain access to it or or um, understand that this is like a thing that you can do. So do you think, and, and I've asked this question more in the context of multi-platform UIs, uh, but now we can generalize it to these patterns. Would you feel that Compose is like the gateway drug for Kotlin? Um, at least, yeah, I don't have a lot of context on uh, UI toolkits on, on other other platforms. Uh, at, at least on um, on Android, like the fact that you can learn, learn Compose UI, build something with it, and then extremely 
easily port that to run on the desktop with very minimal changes to your build. Um, that's like a really exciting feeling. And, and it's the thing that makes, you know, toolkits like Flutter and even just writing for the web, uh, a thing that's really appealing. And so for whatever reason, you know, a lot of people are sort of forced into Compose UI just by virtue of, you know, being an Android developer and um, the sort of stigma around whether you should build for native or build for cross-platform technologies. Um, it's nice that the thing that's now becoming the sort of Android first party UI toolkit is also the thing that allows you to build in multi-platform and, and um, you know, very easily get you into that sort of world of building, of targeting multi-platform. Suck it. Thoughts on, uh, on Compose as a gateway drug for Kotlin? I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that if you're using Compose, you're forced to use Kotlin. But if you if you enjoy writing Kotlin and you enjoy writing the layouts in Kotlin, then you sort of like in, I know that we have contour, but uh, it's not something we use anymore for new screens. And your only option now is, is have compose. So would you say just that it uh it feels natural? Uh, when you're already kind of in the in the comp, uh, in the Kotlin ecosystem, it seems that that Compose would be the the obvious choice nowadays. Yep. I mean, you could write uh, views in Kotlin, but they were not optimized for Kotlin. They were always XML first, and so doing that was a pain. We managed it somehow. We wrote uh, Contour, but it was not uh, the entire tooling around. Uh, UI on Android was not natural. Um, it is becoming now with Compose. So I'm not an Android developer. I, I won't get tired of saying that. And I, the other day, I was trying to write a small Android app, and I decided to start with the traditional way. And I struggled. And then I tried with Compose. And I was pleasantly surprised how quickly I managed to get something up and running. And I don't know if that's kind of you know, because I understand Kotlin a little bit and I understand uh, the idea behind it or, or what is it? Do you folks have any experience with people that you hire that may not be very well experienced in Android and have kind of had a similar reactions or not? I can, I can try answering this, not because I mentored anyone new, but because I, uh, I gave some lectures at um, University of Waterloo uh, in, in Canada earlier this year, last month actually. And when I was invited, the only reason I accepted it was because I, I knew that teaching them Android using Compose UI would be doable within a few uh, guest lectures. But if we still had views, I would have never agreed to do the lecture because I, I, I know it's, it's impossible to teach someone Android with XML and we use um, as quickly. So I'm sure I would have spent my all my lectures just t uh, telling them about XML and, and all the hoops you have to jump, all the files you have to create with XML. I would have totally confused them. <laughs> yeah. Um... I was I was kind of wondering the the, the same thing until I uh, saw the the tweet from Florina recently, who's one of the developer advocates at at Google, um, who posted a little flowchart. And the the one thing that stood out to me was uh, it was supposed to help you decide between whether you should choose Views or Compose. Uh, and the arrow for learning Android went just straight to Compose. No more no more branches. Just straight. Just go to Compose. So you'd say that is something that you'd agree with? Yep. Do not do not start with views if you're learning Android. Go directly to Compose. Um, views are a waste of time now, and they're only there because they've existed for so long. But it's time to phase um, the old system out. It's time to it's time for XML to die. And for us to There's nothing content. wrong with XML. Stop picking on XML. I mean, maybe in the context of views, but XML has its space. You know, everyone yes. hated XML and Maven, and look what we got instead. I was saying that we were treating XML as something it was not on Android. We were, we were trying to use XML as a 
dynamic language where you could have logic. And we came up with data binding to solve that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, the state of XML in Android is what we hate. I'm sure XML has better uh, usages outside. Yeah, it's one of those things that early on in Android, when you know the design of applications and phones was dramatically simpler, um, much more akin to like the very early days of of the web, where um, you know it's just basically displaying data and, and sort of standard layouts with very little flourish. Well, it looks like we're a little bit out of time or over time, but it's, but it's always awesome when we're having a great topic to, to discuss. But uh, I guess I, I sometimes ask this question always with everything. Do you have any regrets with the decisions you've made in terms of adopting Compose? Um, I don't think so. Maybe that's, that's what I should answer. Let's do this. <laughs> okay. That's that, great. That, that works. Yeah, that <laughs> that's works. actually, that's excellent. Uh, I'm I'm sure the the Google folks are very excited about that. Uh, then, but then on the flip side, do you have any kind of recommendations for people who haven't adopted uh, Compose yet, or who are standing at the beginning of their career uh, with with Android? Besides just pick Compose over Views. I mean, if you if you're starting, then there's not much to. Uh, share to start with Compose. Uh, if you're adopting Compose, I would say that I would highly recommend having snapshot tests in place. I mean, it's, it's very normal for companies to have unit tests for their business code, but that's not um, common for UI. And if you're adopting a new framework, you have to have high confidence that nothing will break once you're migrating. You can you can test manually, but humans will make mistakes, uh, and humans cannot be relied on. It's best to have robots testing or catching regressions. I think that's uh, very useful for people. Uh, I, I guess it makes a lot of sense to uh, make sure you don't just uh, rely on behavior that you haven't specified anywhere or on designs that you haven't specified everywhere uh, that might just get lost in the transition otherwise. Well, I think it's time for us to wrap up, Seb. So that's any right. last comments from you, my friend? My last comment is thank you so much for uh, coming on the show. Uh, it was really nice having the two of you. Uh, and we're, of course, hoping to see you folks at Kotlin Conf in 2023. Apart from that, uh, I think we're done here. Actually, no. You know what? Just what? really briefly so that we don't get the mean it's comments. It's hot and humid. There move we on. go. Yeah, slightly overcast. How's the weather? <laughs> ah, move on. Boring. <laughs> All right, cool. See you all, all next have time. A... See you in the next episode. Bye-bye. <laughs>